Welcome, everyone, to Defining Leadership, the podcast where we kind of spend some time exploring you know, how, how leadership has evolved and some of the traits and the skills that that we need to have today to to lead and guide teams. Um, I'm joined here by with J.D. Mixon. What's up, J.D.? Hi, how are you doing, Bart? Just doing well. And we've got a special guest. We've got Gail with Retail Resilient. How are you this morning, Gail? I am good. I am good. Um, it's great to have you on. Uh, we're going to discuss a really interesting topic today. Uh, and I think it's it's uh, funny that that your company is Retail Resilient because we're going to be talking about resilience. Um, maybe we just kind of we kind of open it up. What do you, what do you guys what do you what's the definition or how would you how would you uh, put a label on resilience? Well, resilience to me is kind of, I guess, the capacity capacity of how you're going to recover from something. Okay, so if something gets thrown at you, how are you going to take that difficulty and challenge and, you know, make it a part of your story and come back with some resilience and bounce back, whether it's personally or professionally. So it's, it's kind of... Um, in in short short version the capacity to withstand a difficulty and i believe my employees and all of our clients are extremely resilient and most of my friends actually yeah i think that's uh you know you surround yourself with with kind of the people you want to be or the model you want to have right so i think that's that's true what do you think jd what's resilience well, well, first, I, I guess I shouldn't have let Gail go first because you gave a perfect definition. Um, but I, I loved how you said it's being able to bounce back from setbacks. And one of the important things when, when you consider this in the context of leadership is not just you personally bouncing back, but being able to exude that, being able to make sure that your team around you is also able to bounce back and, and continue to, to lead through this uh through any difficulties yeah isn't that the isn't that the the byproduct of, of a resilient leader uh i mean in other words you can't have a resilient team or a resilient organization if you're uh as the as the leader if you don't have that resilience i think you you, you know your team will follow you on that i i would agree which goes to the what i was telling bart i i have owned this company for seven years and I almost shut down the doors um, once or twice. And I said, no, no, I'm resilient. My mom ingrained that in my, in my DNA. We're going to keep going. So we're going to take the beating and the setback. And we're going to look at the bigger picture. And we're going to figure out how to move forward. And we're still here. And we're, we're doing really well right now. But um, yeah, I almost shut down the business twice. And I had to look in the mirror and be like, how resilient am how resilient am I really, you know? Yeah. This is one of those questions that, that, that I was thinking about before we started. Um, you know, I feel like from a salesperson standpoint, because that's, you know, my, my background in variable, uh, I would look for resilience before I would hire somebody. I would really try to question and find out how resilient that person was, because that's a trait that you have to have in that it, it's very, it's, it's just magnified if you do or do not have resilience. Is this trait of resilience, is it nurtured or is it nature? You kind of brought that your your mom instilled that into your DNA, which, you know, kind of, you did a good job of straddling that, that fence, right? But do you guys think that this is something that can be taught and developed or, or is it something that's just ingrained in a person? So I believe that yes, someone can be, you know, a little more naturally resilient from the get go. But I also feel that a leader that is resilient themselves can help put in place maybe processes or procedures to improve that resilience within their team. Um, because what I think about what well, we've said, it, but just being able to come back from a failure or a setback, right? So if we can help keep the focus on the positive side of any situation, uh, for instance, if 
part, you were on the variable side. If you were working a car deal, you lost that deal because of X reason. Perhaps it was something you did or something someone else did. If we can have processes in place to make sure that our team still saw some success in that difficulty, that's something that can be learned. You know, that's a way that we can try to build that resilience without them even realizing it. Um, so yes, I'm going to, I'm going to also straddle that line, but I do think it's a combination. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I, I think, I think I kind of agree with JD here. So it's something you can be born with, but a lot of people who are resilient and it, it goes way back into like their childhood of like what created that behavior pattern of resilience. Um, and obviously a lot of people that know me know that, um, I'm very into like personal growth and healing and stuff like that. Well, when you start to go back, when you start to look at your human behavior patterns in your professional life or your personal life for success or failure, and you go back to your childhood, a lot of those skills are developed then like a lot of kids from, like I'll I'll use myself as an example in my group of friends. I came from a group of friends uh, who all had divorced parents, um, all came from like really tough upbringing situations. And when you have a tough upbringing, you kind of become resilient naturally um, in how you handle things because your family became disconnected, right? So you learn that skill set based on the experiences you've had if you start to look back into your life of, you know, this happened and I had to take care of myself when I was 15 years old. So I had to become resilient because I was 15 years old. Um, so it's interesting when you start to dig in, like if you get to know the people that work for you, that work in your sales or your management staff or even your clients and you start asking them about their personal life, you find where the resilience came from originally. It's very interesting. Yeah, and I think that if we prescribe to this concept of a growth mindset, in other words, we, you know, it, there's not a fixed point or a fixed cap on on what somebody can learn and develop and and how they can how they can grow, then I think you know I think it's it is nurturable, you know. There's probably a lot of nature involved here, but I think that you know you're mentioning that a lot of that your environment created this. It forced you to to develop resilience, which implies that you can you know, become resilient. And, and I think that it's kind of interesting. I think that growth mindset is a byproduct or, or, um, uh, something that, that, that comes out of an, a resilient leader is they have the ability to, to always grow and always push themselves. Um, you know, you, you mentioned it, JD, if, if I'm, if I'm working a car deal and it didn't go the way I want it to, if I can learn from it, if I can have a positive uh, uh, spin on the fact that that didn't happen. That's a growth mindset. Yep. The growth leader. Um, I have a really good example. So when I worked at Viato, um, my mentor was John Griffin. A lot of people in the auto industry know John Griffin and very much respect that man, him and Dale Pollock and Dale and John, their motto for their Viato consultants was embrace failure. And the amount of times I had to embrace failure and they're like, Gail, hold it tight because I know you hate it. We know you hate it. You hate failure. It feels so bad. They make you like hug it and love it. And then you learn from it and you're like, oh, I should have done this differently. And then the next time they allow you the opportunity to grow and you like truly actually learn from embracing failure because they don't reprimand you. They let you feel it. And there's many times where I had to feel it. So I don't know, I, that just, you know, adds on to your growth mindset. It, uh, resilient leaders are very good people to work for when they allow you to embrace those failures and learn from them. Yeah, I think that's an interesting uh, way to look at it as well as resilience doesn't mean um, ignoring the failure. It doesn't right. mean that, yeah, we don't focus on the failure necessarily. It means we, we, it's all on how we look at the failure and how we approach it and, and, and what we can learn from it. Where do we draw that line between resilience and being stubborn and how, how much are those correlated? Where do we draw the line in terms of like, 
looking at yourself or keeping retaining your employees when you're doing a performance evaluation? <laughs> well, that that's a really great question. If you think about it, you've got to be, you've got to be, you've got to have your principles, right? You've got to have your processes or whatever you've developed, your systems, your operational, you know, guidelines in place that, you know, work and you've got to be willing to like, you know, plow through or push through challenges. But at the same time, you've got to, you've got to be agile, right? You you can't, you can't be so stubborn or stuck as you're saying, JD, that you can't develop and learn and grow. That's, that's a fine line to, 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 that's a fine thing to balance. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough also too, when you have employees and you're trying to grow their resilience skill set and they are stubborn. It's like, how do you get them to see outside of that picture and look at it differently? I mean, I know I'm stubborn in certain ways, but yeah, as a leader leading an organization, I, I can, now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like there's quite a few times in the last 20 years in my career where I've been a manager or a owner and I've had to have those conversations with employees. Those are hard because they, they only see it their way or they see it another way, but they are being stubborn. And it's, it's pride, it's ego and pride of like, no, I'm going to hold my ground and I'm, you know, going to look at it my way, even though I kind of agree with what my boss is saying. Yeah. More important to be right sometimes for some folks. Yeah. And I think that it's easy to confuse that with resilience sometimes too. Right. Like um, there's this, there's this concept uh, there's this Greek word called scotoma and in the medical field, in medical terms, it means a blind spot. Uh, but if we look at it from a, an employee development standpoint, if you have a scotoma, it's that you don't know, what you are doing or what you, you don't know you need the third party as a leader you need a third party to come in and go jd you realize that you're doing this uh and it's really you know because you don't even realize it's happening and a lot of that you know if a resilient leader i think you've got to have that stick to it and that stubbornness but sometimes you need to be able to listen to somebody to tell you you know yeah a lot of resilient leaders too are very emotionally intelligent like a lot of the people I know in the auto industry, um, even some of the guys I went to school with at Northwood, part of the curriculum was, you know, doing the tests to see what your EI score is um, and really looking at yourself. So I do know a lot of the leaders I've met are very um, cued in about their emotional intelligence. Yeah, I think I think that we've, we've kind of, as long as with this growth mindset, I think that we're going to put in that, in that, uh, what is resilient bucket? I think you got to have some humility. You know, you've got to be willing to, to adapt and change and, and to be humble and, and to take some of that criticism. Mm -hmm. What do you think, what do you think stops or blocks someone from, from being resilient? What, what gets in the way? More than anything, self-doubt just, it's where we decide to put our focus. Um, and Gail, as you mentioned, you know, leading your team, leading your employees um, from a leadership perspective, we've got to keep them focused on the end goal. And it uh, just that, that doubt that, that we can have internally is going to immediately make us less resilient. Mm hmm yeah, self-doubt. I that's a very good word I would say of what would prevent you from moving forward and being resilient. That is tough. You know, when you have struggle after struggle or you kind of, you know, let's say you're running a dealership and the economy turns and then you can't get inventory and then three of your employees are sick and you're like, "Oh my god, like I holy setbacks over and over and over." You start to self-doubt, like, am I supposed to be here right now? Should I be doing this? Are we ever going to get out of this hole? How on God's earth am I going to get inventory? Like, you do start to doubt yourself. I've definitely been through that before. 
this is where this is where I I I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. This is where I kind of fail uh, when we talk about resilience. Is when something like that happens, my natural gut reaction is to do it all or try to do it all myself. Yeah. You know, because I have I I know I can do it. And so instead of like maybe delegating and 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 developing those people around me, uh, it's more, you know, get out of my way. I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna do it. And, and I think that's a, that's a flaw. I, I think you've got to, you know, part of re being resilient is to, to uh, acknowledge and reward a zillion, I mean, resilience in your staff, right? Mm -hmm. Acknowledge and reward the fact that you've got staff that you are developing to be resilient and that they can help. It's not, you have to do it all yourself. I mean, we never see that in sales managers, do we? That never happens to sales managers. <laughs> right never but bart that's like a really important like the fact that you just said hey i've looked at this and i know when i go through those setbacks i don't delegate that's like the key of like what do you do as a leader when you know it's happening so what I do is I shut down and I stop working and I go do my meditation and my yoga because I can't get out of that headspace if I'm like when I'm in it, that's the only way I know how to get out of it. So, right. It's like, what do you do when you're in that headspace? So like Bart, you delegate, but then what do you, what do you do? Right. So, so, so I think that, you know, if, if we, this is really, you know, unicorns and rainbows, but I feel like that when you look back on your life, we've all had major setbacks and uh, we're still here. Right. And if you look back at that time and I, you know, I'm, I'm going to kind of go back to the 15 year olds cause those, that's when it really magnifies. Right. But back then you would, you would have something that would be a setback that would be the biggest like most important, most devastating setback ever in the history of ever. Yeah. And now you look back on it and we're all laughing, right? Like, oh man. Yeah. So, so I think that that perspective that you're talking about is very important. Like we have, we have been through, all of us have, have been through things and survived and, and, and developed and, and puts us where we are now, wherever that is in your life that, you know, you're still here. It's not the end of the world. And, and I think you stepping back and kind of meditating or thinking about it or, or kind of developing some, some self-care, I think is a great way to regain the perspective and approach the, the problem or the, or the issue. Well, I was, I was just being triggered by thoughts of high school dances for the things that I thought where I would never be able to overcome those. So it was that the only one. Like in high school dances, I don't know. Uh, That's no, a good one. Uh, it, yes. Um, Great one. Yeah, having that. That I, I've had so many of these conversations recently. I, my oldest daughter um, is about to turn eleven, and it's it's a great exercise for. Good luck, buddy. Yeah, I know. Well, it's a great exercise for me though to to look at the things that are so impactful to a young person and remembering back about how I felt that same way, right? And not discounting that emotion, but realizing that every single one of us is going to um, feel that a setback or we're going to absorb that setback in a totally different way. So when I'm working with a teammate or an employee, that's important to remember. This might not be a big deal to me, but to them, this could be just catastrophic, right? Like whether it's just financial, um, a financial setback, an emotional setback, whatever that is, it's going to affect all of us differently. And that's been, to learn that from a from a 10 year old uh, has been great for me. Yeah, Gail, I know you've mentioned this before and you know, if anybody follows you on Facebook, they know you're big, you, you surf a lot. You, you know, you're always out. I don't want to say recharging, but, but you do spend a lot of time on, on, you know, developing yourself and, and uh, he talks to us a little bit about how that's impacted you or, or, you know, maybe we go back to a step back and you comment a little bit more on gaining that perspective. What do you think? Um, 
yeah, it, it kind of like all started for me. I remember this. I remember this very clearly in 2016. Um, I was going through like a lot in my life and I was considering leaving the car business. And before I, I, I started shutting down really bad and I went on this yoga retreat and it was like a life changing seven days for me in Hawaii. And they opened up my like heart and soul to like, Hey Gail, when you feel that way, you don't have to feel that way. You can take a step back and you can do all these other things that'll get you out of that headspace. So I spent a week learning how to kind of reprogram your nervous system from like fight or flight, like some of that stuff and like clearing out whatever's bothering you. Um, Cause a lot of it had to do with work and like a lot of what's bothering you. And then like looking at it from a different viewpoint. So after that, I decided I made a commitment to myself in my journal that I would do all these things. And I did like I quit my job, started a business, started like like I had to force myself in the beginning to do yoga, surfing and meditation. Like I loved it, but I still had to force myself because I was addicted to work like I had a work addiction, like a bad work addiction. Um, and so I would force myself to do fun things to get myself out of a headspace. And then over time, my patterns became more natural. So like, I'm part of a mental health surf group right now. And every Saturday, we sit in a circle for half an hour. It's all about mental health and people, you know, talking about things going on. And then we go surf together in the water. It's very cool. So, um, I, I know a lot of people in the auto industry are workaholics and it is hard to get yourself like when, when you don't feel good or something's bothering you, it's like, it's like you want to fix it, but sometimes you need to step out of it to fix it. So I use surf and yoga to step out of it, to try to fix what's happening. And usually it has nothing to do with work. I'm just burnt out in overload. I'm not del Like you said, I'm not delegating. Like I'm like, I need to change myself. So yeah, the yoga and surf is very helpful. Let, let me let me put this in a, a car a car metaphor. The, and I and you know you have you have understood the importance of of regular and routine maintenance uh, on your vehicle, and um, I think uh, uh, we all need to learn what the triggers are like what 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 causes that check engine light to go on mm -hmm. because because like you your check check engine light goes on your your little coolant light goes on or whatever you can't just ignore it right you've got to you've got to take care of it and we've got to we've got to understand and identify all right i'm 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 headed i'm headed to a bad spot mm -hmm. if i want to be resilient that doesn't mean ignoring the issue that means i got to get grounded and figure out what uh Kind of get get my priorities back in order. You mean you don't just get the little uh you don't go to AutoZone and get the little clear the code clear and just clear it off your yeah. vehicle. You can't do that personally. I I take it. <laughs> That's a really good analogy. Yeah, like your body is your temple or your car. When the check engine light goes on, you need to address it, or you get a flat tire. Mm -hmm. Like you have to address it. You can't just sit there and keep working. Like you can, but it's going to get worse. Yeah. But what's great about what you do with your Saturday surf group is you're getting your medication in advance, right? You're not waiting for that. And and we all have to find that. Like I personally, I'm part of a Sunday morning book club. Um, my, my wife loves to call it our salon because she just thinks it's a, a, a group of guys that just gets together and, you know, talks about whatever, you know, it's, it's, barbershop talk but but it's similar to what you're describing with your <laughs> surf group yes we do have uh, you know we stay on top but we have a book that we're always reading I, I say always but we haven't had one for a month now but but we still get together and we discuss what's going on and it's not and I don't mean discuss like you don't have to you don't have to find someone that you can spill your heart out to but it's having that connection it's having that community and having that group that you know you can mm -hmm. go to when you need it. And so we've all got to find that. Um, I think that's another another way that we can coach resilience is by maybe helping create that platform for our teams. 
you know, making sure that they're aware that they've got a place to go, that open communication, that employee engagement side. Uh, it's just, it, it's important. You know, yeah. how, what do you do to cope? What, what's your, what are you, uh, what's your surf club or book group? I need one. I need one. I don't surf and I don't do yoga, but I need to, I need to, I need to find something. <laughs> It could even be like, Bart, you're going for a walk outside for an hour, right? Like it could be walking your dog. That that alone actually is therapeutic. <laughs> right. It's just the fact that you can, that you can, you're in the middle of it, whatever it is, and you can say, time out. You know, I, um, I, I you, you can take a metaphorical time out and, and, and regroup. Um, and I'd, I'd like to, as we, as we kind of are, are, are going through this, I would like to see and pick your, both of your brains on why this is such a big deal right now. Um, why becoming a resilient leader and developing a resilient team is so vital and important right now. Well, Bart, this is certainly a conversation that, that we have a lot of driving sales, but through the last few, uh, couple of years in auto, especially on the sales side, even when, even though inventory may have been difficult, being on the sales floor, you've become an order taker, right? And that's, there's, we're transitioning. It's our, our sales team, they can't just sit back, wait for the customer to walk in and buy whatever is on the lot because it's on the lot. And as a leader in a dealership, again, especially on that sales floor, we're going to have a lot of salespeople that are going to see reductions potentially in what they're bringing home at the end of the week. And if they're not resilient, we will lose them to other industries or they will stick around and bring the rest of the team down. Right. So we've got to be building that resilience very quickly in our teams because they may have lost it. I, I think that's not, we haven't even discussed that, but you can lose your resilience and Mm -hmm. it's it's I in no way want to discount the the difficulties that we always are having in in the auto industry but on the sales floor it has been a little easier this last couple of years to move metal uh, than it was previously and and then where we're going um you know gail you're in stores all the time what are you seeing on that um yeah, these are, I was going to say, I see a lot of interesting things. So I agree. The last three years have been so easy to sell a car. Oh my God. At MSRP or higher, just like, it, uh, I should have just went into sales for a year for fun. But um, I think now's the time. And well, not, I think I know now is the time. So I'm looking at dealers. I go into their dealer socket and VIN solutions now. And I look at their follow-up and you know, what are their phone calls? Day one, day three, day five, what are they doing for emails? And I just want, I just go, oh, oh. So my team's busy and my team, what they've been doing is meeting with these owners and their staff going, guys, you have to start doing follow-up. Like the average days to sale is 30 to 45 days. So if you call them twice, like you just lost that car deal to another dealer. Um, that's what I'm seeing is like salespeople forgot how to be resilient. Exactly what JD said. They, it's like they lost it because they coasted for three years and made so much money that now they're like, wait a minute, I have to work. <laughs> I have to do follow up. What is that? Um, we're going through that right now with multiple clients of ours. And the owners, like, they don't like having those conversations. Like, we have to bring, here's the bad news. Hey, by the way, Mr. Dealer Principal, here's the bad news. You think your salespeople are doing follow-up, but they're not. Let me show you. I mystery shopped them. So we just this week mystery shopped about 10 of our clients. And it it was, it hurt my heart. It hurt my heart. <laughs> Let's just say that. It wasn't good. <laughs> I, I, I think that there's another thing you throw on top of this. And, and maybe you can speak a little bit more to the scale because you're, you're, you're seeing it that, uh, you know, go back and look at Moore's law and how fast technology's changed since, you know, the, the, the mid nineties, how, how much and how crazy things are getting 
from a from a vehicle getting a lot more sophisticated but from the systems that dealers are using is are they getting a you know it's just there's a lot of change the way that they can sell a vehicle the you know the 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 modifications to a sales process in the last 10 years it's it's ridiculous it's crazy and there's so much change it's just going to get more and more rampant or you know uh you have to have resilience in your team because you might tomorrow say okay guys here's the new thing here's the next yep. thing here's the trend we have to we have to embrace it yep here's the new digital retailing <laughs> tool here's the new ai system which by the way with AI, I have asked multiple dealers to shut it off because it's actually hurting their sales process, not helping their sales process. Um, so again, we mystery shop multiple stores and like Haley or Joanna would answer the phone. I mean, this AI bot who sounded kind of human and she just pissed me off. She pissed off the mystery shoppers. She pissed me off. Like we were all angry and frustrated and we're like, I need to talk to a salesperson. Yes. Like, why is this bot continually saying things to me and repeating themselves? I'm getting nowhere. And you just don't want to do business with that car dealer anymore. So I've asked multiple dealer principals who thought it was a great idea to shut it off and have human beings have conversations with these customers because it is frustrating. If the, if the bot is not set up appropriately with the sales process in complete alignment, it's a disaster. Um, so yeah. yes, the AI, the social medias and the digital retailing tools. And I mean, you need all of this stuff for your sales process. And then your sales staff needs to understand what their role is in respect to the software. Mm -hmm. And a lot of managers don't explain it to them. Yeah. Like, what is your role in, in relation to how this software operates? Well, I'm so glad that you did mention AI because I was also helping a, uh, a client recently with their CRM and in speaking to a few of their um, advisors and sales team, all I kept hearing was, well, why can't AI just respond to all of these emails for me? Why can't AI do this? Why can't AI do that? And we have <laughs> to remember high technology means high touch as well. And I mean a high personal touch. Because you gave a great example, Gail, with the automated phone systems, or if it's a chat bot, yes, um, it, it can it can help. There's certain things that it can do, but ultimately, who are they going to be working with on this sale, on this deal? They're going to be working with, you know, Melissa on the sales floor, John, or whomever it is. They're going to be working with a real person, and we've got to start building that relationship. And that happens at a personal level because we don't want to just sell this person one vehicle or have them service it, and just get their oil changed. Like we need to establish that relationship. And we're going to do that through them hearing our voice, through us being empathetic to whatever they're dealing with. AI doesn't have that yet. Maybe one day, but it's yeah. whether it's graphics or a phone call or a chat bot, if golly, if the only answer that people keep throwing out there is AI, uh, they're going to be uh, less resilient by far. <laughs> That's not your solution I, for everything. I would agree. I would agree. AI has its place. So one thing I, I think about with uh, watching your presentations in the past, Gail, and just knowing um, how successful you are with your clients, social media when you're training someone, we have people that, you know, you hear about all this massive, um, this massive amount of money folks are making on TikTok or Instagram or whatever it is. And they expect their first video to all of a sudden go viral and they get 20 million views and they don't. Your industry on the social media side, you have to have some real resilience and be able to stick with it. How do you communicate that with, your clients to make them understand, no, it's not your first 10 posts or your first 15. It might be 200 posts down the line that you actually get some real um, engagement. That's a very good question. Um, okay. So I have two things, two, two, I guess, ways to go here. So in regards to people making money from the platforms, um, 
you can make a lot of money. So Instagram actually, and Facebook have reached out to me and they asked me to produce more content in videos. And they asked me to do like two or three a day and they would pay me on them. I don't have time. And I don't want $10. They were like, we'll give you $10 a video or whatever it is. I don't have time. I have a marketing director that does that stuff. And that's not my job in life. However, people who are consistent, uh, that want to get paid by those platforms. Um, and there are a couple sales people that I know that get paid off those platforms in like, you know, they'll make like a couple grand a month, but they're consistent. They do two to three videos a day. That's a lot of content. So two to three TikToks a day or two to three reels a day. And the platform pays them out, you know, $10, $20 per video. And it really starts to add up and put money in their pocket. Um, so that's one way to look at social media. But in regards to like, what does a salesperson do? Because salespeople are not going to do that. Like it's very rare for a car auto industry salesperson to do that. Um, they ha You have to start somewhere. So, I mean, we have really cool case studies on salespeople. Um, and even myself with my own business, you have to start. So I tell people start with three posts a week. Okay. So, you know, one day is your hot trade alert, one day is a new car, and one day is like, check, do a lot walk or something. And people start to, they watch for your content. Like they'll watch it every single week and they may not comment, they may not share, they may not like it, but I guarantee you they're watching it. And I know that from my personal experience and from multiple salespeople that are like, Gail, this random person called me, bought a car for me and said they had been watching my hot trade alerts for like a year straight and they came and bought a car for me. So social media is so widespread. You're never going to know who's watching you. You never know who your followers are, um, but you just need to have the confidence that what you say is valuable, like what you're telling your community is valuable. Um, and at some point, at some point, you're going to get sales from it. But the fastest way to get sales from social media, there's two ways you can do it really fast. Um, one is marketplace. Like posting your cars in Facebook marketplace is free and all it takes is time. Easy. Like if you're, most sales guys sell five to 10 extra cars a month off marketplace. Um, in regards to posting organically, if you tag your friends and you post like every delivery that you have, people in the community are going to start watching that. And they're going to be like, I want to get tagged. I want to be in one of your delivery photos. Um, th those are like kind of the two organic free ways to go about it. But yeah, JD, we do a lot of um, telling them to trust the process. Like it's a process and they have to be consistent. So. Yeah, I think this, this, this concept of what you're saying is of, I'm going to uh, modify it a little bit and call it instead of consistent, maybe we call it persistence. It's the same thing, right? I mean, you have to, you have to maintain that discipline and that's, that's a, I think that's a, that's another one of the, uh, the uh, defining attributes of, of someone who's resilient. You, you, you keep going now you have to, you have to be intelligent enough to know that it, yeah. you know, when to stop, right? Like, okay. But at the end of the day, that 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 persistence is is another one of those key traits, mm -hmm. and don't give up on it. Yep. So yeah. Well, uh, we would love to hear from anybody out there um, how you define as a leader resilience. What you're doing inside of your store to to try to foster that, and to develop it, and and to develop it uh, within yourself. Uh, but once again, thanks for listening, Gail. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate the, the time and the and the input. I know I kind of threw some some loaded questions at you, uh, but but I appreciate you you uh, coming on and and kind of defining and talking about this. Yeah, thanks. That was fun. I like talking about it. Thanks for having me. <laughs> hey, and uh, before we go, Gail, is there if someone wants to reach out to you, how should they uh, how should they do that? So it says re our website is retail resilient, uh, not resilience. Well, I think I redirected retail resilience to my website anyway, but uh, I bought the domain. So retailresilient.com um, or I mean, I usually will just, you know, my email is gail at retail resilient. Um, but yeah, I see everything that happens on the website. 
So any forms that come in, text messages, I see it all. <laughs> you can find me or Facebook me. I'm all over social media. Just like look up my name and people will see me. Yeah. yeah J JD, thanks for joining us as well. Um, you can email us at podcast at driving sales.com. If you, uh, if you have anything you want to throw our way, we really appreciate the, uh, the input as well as the, uh, you know, some of the feedback. Um, you can also join the discussions happening right now in our community at driving sales.com. Um, you know, we've, we, this is one of those topics that's, that's that we, uh, that we need to be discussing and we need to, to, to make sure that everybody's aware of it. Um, and Gail from retail resilient. Thanks a lot. Uh, we appreciate it. And we hope to see you guys on future driving sales podcasts.